Okay, I know you guys have been waiting for me to cover the game with the big tree. I read your comments. I know what you guys are about. So here, here's a video about the big tree game, Elden Ring. Today we will be talking about Caleb. Yeah, you heard me right. We will not be covering the Erdtree in this video. Instead, we will opt for Caleb because I believe there's a lot of really good stuff we can talk about there. So join me, won't you, as I talk over footage that I had someone else get because I am bad at Soulsborne games. So, why Caleb? Well, I think it's a great opportunity to talk about something that affects all of us in our day-to-day -day lives, whether we notice it or not. And today that topic will be invasive species. Yep, isn't that such a lighthearted topic full of whimsy and wonder? Well, with the way our world is headed ecologically, I think it's an important topic to cover. So, let's dive into Caleb, the land of the Scarlet Rot. And here's the disclosure. Like I said in the beginning, I'm horrible at Soulsborne games. All of them. I know I need to just get good, but here's the thing. I would rather just watch someone play these games and enjoy the story and atmosphere, instead of getting angry myself. I get super frustrated while playing these games. Gee, it's almost as if that's the entire point of them. Bottom line is, I have only played a very, very small amount of Elden Ring myself. All that being said, I think this game is stunningly beautiful, even in this area of rotten decay. It has such a unique atmosphere. So what's the deal with Caleb anyways? How did it get this way? Well, I'm not entirely sure. Reading the fandom wiki is like reading a complex history textbook about the fall of the Prussian Empire without the context of World War I. What I'm trying to say is, I have no idea. Apparently there was a war there at one point, and that's as far as I can understand. I even had the guy who got me this footage explain it to me, and I still didn't quite get it. What I do remember reading was something about a flower of Aeonia blooming, and suddenly the land was covered in rot. Okay, finally, something I can understand flowers. So, let's discuss what could have potentially happened in Caelid. Aeonia is complicated. I don't entirely understand it, but what I can gather is that it leads to Scarlet Rot, which is exactly what it sounds like. Everything is red and rotting. It's also a status effect acting as a poison to the player. Throughout the land you see these massive fungal protrusions coming from the trees. Here we go, it's science time. Time for me to finally talk about something I do know, invasive species. I believe the Scarlet Rot is a perfect representation of this problem. There are plenty of real world examples which we'll dive into. Let's start with something closest to Kayla's little problem, fungal invasive species. Before we get started with the main body of this essay, I want to define invasive species for you. Invasive species are anything non-native that has a negative effect ecologically, economically, or on human health. So for example, Orange trees in Florida wouldn't be considered an invasive species even though they're from China, but the Burmese python would be. One is a crop that we maintain and grow to benefit ourselves, while the other eats just about anything it can fit in its very large, horrifying mouth. Now that we have that definition out of the way, I want to talk about Castanea dentata, the American chestnut. If you were ever wondering why we don't really roast chestnuts over an open fire around Christmas time, well, there's a very sad reason. While it used to make up around 50% of most eastern hardwood forests, today it's virtually extinct in the wild. That's thanks to this little menace, Cryphonectria parasitica, the chestnut blight. This fungal infection originated in China but has since migrated across the United States. We suspect it got here sometime in the late 1800s. Our records officially started recording it around 1904 in New York. Since then, acres of forests have been decimated by the blight. Funny enough, just like Caleb, it has a rusty red appearance to it. This is most likely a coincidence, though. They kill trees by essentially destroying the vascular tissues, and they can get to them through even the tiniest hole in the bark. It doesn't even need to go all the way through in order to start an infection. So imagine if a little bug of some sort chewed a hole, and then BAM! Instant infection from airborne spores. It really is that fast, too. And to add more to it, once the tree is completely dead, the fungus still continues to grow and colonize it. More spores, more infections, more dead trees. So what can we do to fix it? Well, there really isn't a whole lot we can do at this point. Whether we like it or not, the blight is here. Well, the Chinese chestnut has a natural resistance. 
The American Chestnut Foundation has been trying to crossbreed the two trees to have all of the positive traits of the American Chestnut with the resistances of the Chinese Chestnut. But here's the catch. Crossbreeding takes years, and you never know what the end result will be. That's why we have genetic modification, though. I talked about this exact same thing in a previous video about Follett's Vault 22 and genetic modification. I wish I would have gone into more detail about this there, but hey, better late than never. One of the ways C. parasitica kills off plant cells is through oxalic acid. Well, we have found a way to insert genes from wheat that contain the blueprints for oxalate oxidase, an enzyme that converts oxalic acid into carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide. With this gene, the American chestnut would be able to nullify the effects of the oxalic acid, and thus, the fungal infection would become completely harmless. Okay, I'm sure you're thinking, that's all well and good, but I'm not an American. What do I care? Well, what about Canada? They've been battling beech bark disease since the late 1800s, and this is actually a double whammy infection. It starts with Cryptococcus fagusuga, a beech scale insect. They eat the bark of the tree, which then allows native Nectria fungi to take hold. The insect itself comes from Europe, so take that, Canada. You're in just as much trouble as we are. Okay, so fungi bad, right? Well, plants can be just as destructive, if not more so in certain circumstances. This right here is Peraria montana, the kudzu vine. If you live in any of these places, then you know what this plant is in excruciating detail. This plant has led to the destruction of entire forests. We're not even sure how fast it's spreading. It could be anywhere from 2,500 acres squared to uh, 150,000 acres squared. For those of you not in the United States, that's 10 kilometers squared to 610 kilometers squared. And that's just in one year. This plant can get up to 98 feet long or 30 meters. It can grow as much as one foot or 0.3 meters a day once established. Yeah, an entire foot in one day. It grows on trees and other plant life, smothering it, breaking it, and even uprooting it. These things have wrecked the Southern United States and even Switzerland and Italy. See, this concerns you too, Europe. So how does it grow so much? Well, it's able to fix nitrogen. This is a process where a plant makes a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that turns the nitrogen in the atmosphere into ammonia in the soil that the plants can then use as a nitrogen source. This means it can survive in harsher environments than some native species. It gets worse though. The nitrates in the soil that are a byproduct of the kudzu leach into our waterways, leading to algae blooms and lower oxygen levels. What are some ways to control kudzu? Well, goats. Yep, you heard right. Get it? Heard? Anyways, goats and cows will graze on kudzu, meaning they have been used to help stop the spread. This is a great alternative to herbicides, which will also destroy what little plant life there is left with the kudzu. So now we know of some invasive species, but why do we care so much? Well, allowing these species to go unchecked can destroy entire ecosystems. Let's go back to the American chestnut. Because it went extinct, wildlife populations diminished, and the chestnut moth even went extinct. This means less food for its predators, less food for their predators, etc, etc. The lives of the people around the chestnut were devastated as well. The people who lived in the area used chestnut wood for economic purposes, but without it, those people lost their livelihoods. This was also hitting the hardest around the time of the Great Depression, which only worsened their problems. If you need a more selfish reason to care about invasive species, the United States loses about $137 billion each year due to invasive species. This is done through loss of crops and applications of pesticides, herbicides, among other things. That's your taxpayer money being used because over a hundred years ago, someone thought kudzu was a good idea. But that's the thing with invasive species. We don't know the damage until it's already done. They couldn't have foreseen the devastation that kudzu would cause. If you enjoy swimming, then remember that kudzu also causes algae blooms to happen. That hurts the tourist industry in those areas, costing even more money. Invasive species destroy the lives of both the native species around it and as humans. So let's link this back to Caleb. I've rambled about sad science for long enough. It's a land that has pretty much been decimated by some sort of fungal growth. The plants in that area are all dead, except for a few that are linked to the herd tree. 
There aren't too many animals in the area either. It's a perfect example of what can happen when invasive species are left to run rampant in an ecosystem. Whatever fungal blight scarlet rot really is has completely eradicated life in the area. Except for a few species which will try to kill you. Scarlet rot is a devastating plague that has ravaged the ecosystem of Kaolin. All life in the area has been destroyed and the landscape has been changed forever. While it's too late for them, it is important to remember that it's not too late for us. We can still save our ecosystems through vigilance and careful eradication of invasive species. It is possible. Take the Palmyra Atoll for example. It used to have swarms of invasive rats on it. They had destroyed the population of Pisonia grandis, a species of tree native to the island. They repeatedly ate the seedlings or trampled them. Finally, after many years of effort, all rats were eradicated and the trees have returned. So have the birds and the crabs and many other natives. They no longer have to compete for food and space. They can finally grow. Caleb is a grim look into the future if invasive species are left unchecked. We put them here either on purpose or accidentally, so it's our responsibility as humans to fix our mistakes. While it may take years, and certainly money, the benefits outweigh the cost in my opinion. We have a duty to our planet to repair the damage we have done by spreading things where they shouldn't be. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe. Also, be sure to click the bell. YouTube sometimes has a bad habit of not showing you guys my videos. While you're down there, please leave a comment. Give me video game and topic ideas. Also, I just like hearing from you guys. If you want more content, be sure to follow me on Twitch at Video Game Botanist. I haven't been streaming very much lately since it's my busy season at work, but hopefully I'll get back to it soon. That's all for now. See you later. Destinate matribus nunc fi.